right. Good afternoon. Um, I'm incredibly excited to be here today. I've had about three transatlantic flights this week, so um, I'm glad you guys are caffeinated, and I'll try and maintain an even cadence in my speech, because when I get excited about things, sometimes I speak a little too quickly. Um, about three years ago, I started a journey not too far away from here in York, um, and I've now flown over a million miles around the world in pursuit of answering a question, which is, what is the future of money? And I hope to share with you a little bit about what I've learned um, on that journey the last few years. And I submit that the future of money may be upon us now. Uh, technologies like Bitcoin and its underlying framework, the blockchain, are going to fundamentally weave themselves into the fabric of our society. Now, these things are exponential technologies, and we actually don't experience exponential growth that frequently, and I mean that in the way we experience the world. But uh, let me provide a parable that kind of helps me think about this. Um, imagine a lily pond that in 30 days will be completely covered by lily pads. And today, we plant one, and tomorrow it doubles in size. And then the next day, there's four, and then after that, there's eight. Does anyone know what day the lily pond will be 50% full? It happens on the 29th day. These things are sneaky, and they sneak up on you. So, I'm 31 years old, I'm a digital native, and I've only ever grown up around technologies, and I think it's kind of exciting to take a little trip down memory lane to help us think about how fast some of these changes are happening. So, let's take a look. I absolutely love photography, so a lot of the pictures you're gonna see in this presentation um, were taken uh, during my travels over the past couple years. Now, this is kind of a fun one because 10 years ago, the iPhone had not been released yet, okay? So let that sink in for just a second. I used to have to develop photography. Now that word is extinct. I can take a picture with my smartphone, I can broadcast it to all my friends all over the world, wherever they are, and uh, instantly I can become a photographer. I used to have to do the same thing with film and movies, which is sort of funny. I used to drive my truck down to the store and hope that they had the VHS or the DVD that was available um, from a new release. But now, at my fingertips on nearly any device, I can download any piece of digital content, I can watch nearly any digitally released new movie, and I can get any song or any book that's ever been written in the history of time. I used to have to keep in touch with my friends and loved ones by writing messages to them. And uh, it's a little annoying when you uh, travel constantly and uh, you forget your mother's birthday, and this is a super risky thing. So now I've got a reminder in my calendar, and I uh, send my mom a message and, and usually some flowers too. But think about just how far we've come in the ability to stay digitally connected. So where does this leave us? Well, the digital world is part of our DNA now. It's part of how we share our experiences, it's part of how we consume our entertainment, and it's part of how we keep in touch with our loved ones, wherever they are. Now, I think it's best not to have your head stuck in the sand on this issue. I think money can be digital too. Now, human beings have optimized all kinds of things. It's kind of what we're really, really good at. We used to live in caves, and then we built shelters. We used to walk around, and then we invented the wheel, and we made roads, and we've done all kinds of things to make our lives a little bit better. Well, we've also tried different forms of money, and this is a topic that should be of real interest to people because a lot of us will spend our entire lives in pursuit of money. And I definitely encourage you to do some saving too. But the most important aspect of this is that we've optimized our money several times. We used to barter, and then we created coins, and then we tried gold, and we've tried paper, and now it may be time to think about it in a slightly different way. What human beings need in order to facilitate commerce is actually a transaction network. Now, we interact with these every single day of our lives, whether it's PayPal or MasterCard or Visa, or these other systems that let us move value around the world. And they all have three things in common. They have a currency that rides on top of them. They have um, a ledger system that keeps track of who owns what. And then they have settlement with a high degree of certainty. Those are the ingredients you need to have a transaction network function. Now, a simple task like sending money from here to a friend should be really quick, right? It's 2017. You know what's crazy? Is it's faster to send an email from here to New York than it is to send $100 today. Banks and all the intermediaries make it very expensive and costly because they have to run billions of dollars of infrastructure just to do simple things like send information around the world. Well, what if there was a better way? Well, in come a new technology called blockchain technology, and it was pioneered by an open source project released in 2009. It has been running without interruption for over eight years now. And this is really interesting. A blockchain is basically like a big spreadsheet in the cloud, except instead of there being one copy of this, they're actually copies of it all over the world. 
And every single one of them is in exactly the same state all the time. Now, if there's one thing you take away from this conversation, try and let this piece settle in. When an update happens on this record keeping system, it is updated globally and simultaneously. There is actually more compute power backing up this network than all of Google. And a lot of people don't know that, but it's true. Now, here's what's really, really cool about this. Once you have a record keeping system that is globally distributed, that not one single person can alter or change, you have a really, really exciting opportunity to reinvent lots of new things. And the first um, project that's been placed on this network is money. So maybe some of you will have heard about a digital currency called Bitcoin. And uh, it's been in circulation now for quite a while. Last year, it was the world's best performing currency on Earth. And there's some reasons for that. But here's what's really exciting. Anyone on the planet can now download a piece of software and instantly put it on their phone that's completely free and open source. You can actually, with 10,000 lines of open source software code, replace your bank. Now let that sink in for a second. Anyone on Earth, regardless of where they were born, what color their skin is, what their credit score looks like, wherever they are, can now put an app on their phone and then start to transact with anybody else on the planet. Now, this is gonna to start to change an awful lot of things. So if you've never seen a digital currency transaction, do some research online and check them out. It's pretty neat. You basically have an address that you can share with anybody, and then they can make a transaction with you. It works an awful lot like email. I can't blindly email somebody if I don't know their address, but if I do, then I can send them a message. And it's the same thing with digital currency. When you make that transaction, it happens on a peer-to-peer -peer network. There's no bank, there's no Forex market, there's no intermediary. It's entirely between the individuals that choose to participate on this open network. And when the transaction happens, it gets broadcast to that big spreadsheet in the sky and all of the nodes in the network update simultaneously. Everyone agrees that a certain amount of value moved from one place to the next. So why is this a really big deal? Well, let's talk a little bit about this. There were $7.7 .7 trillion in credit card transactions last year, costing consumers hundreds of billions of dollars in fees. Every time you swipe your card, they take a little bit of that, and they actually charge you for it. So all this is costing us. But it's not just about credit cards, right? Where I was born in the United States, I just flew in from Bryant Park in New York City yesterday, and can tell you kind of a sad story. There's a pond there, a little pool, and I was uh, having an important meeting, and there was a poor homeless man going through the pond picking up coins. Well, little children were putting uh, coins in there and making dreams and their wishes come true, hopefully. Now, this is in the most prosperous, powerful country on earth. And we have a world where you have monuments to capitalism and people that don't have enough. But it's not just obviously the first world, right? There were 2.5 billion people on planet earth that have zero access to financial services whatsoever today. So here's what's kind of interesting about this technology. What if the parents of two young Thai children had access to a financial protocol that uses the internet that actually allows them to be more efficient than the hedge fund managers in Canary Wharf? Now, doesn't that start to get kind of interesting? All of this technology has been built by an open source community of some of the top cryptographers and computer scientists in the world. And what's really neat about open innovation is it invites everyone to come participate and do code review and make the project better. So we actually have a way of upgrading this system to make it faster and more effective over time. So what is going to happen next is kind of the big question everyone's been asking. Well, every single year since 2009, this network has quietly doubled in transaction volume with more and more people testing it and trying it year after year. So let's remember about that lily pond for just a moment. But once you have that record keeping system, that big spreadsheet in the cloud that constantly agrees about what happened and no central entity owns it, well, you can do a lot more than just economic transactions. You can use it to store reference information to things that you own, like assets, like your house, or shares in a corporation, or maybe diamonds or precious artwork. And there's a company working on that right now. Actually, there's a lot of companies working on that to use the blockchain to keep track of all the property rights in the world. Property rights are the very basic need for capital formation. If you don't have a house, you can't use it as leverage to get a loan for other things. So if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, you need to be thinking about some of these things. Supply chains are kind of interesting. All over the world today, uh, we put things in our bodies and we think that maybe they're organic or that they're sourced from the place that uh, is marketed to us from. But there's actually a very little way to prove that that happened. 
Well, if there was a network that was impossible to forge that could track the origin of things like tuna from sea for, to a fishing boat to transportation to our uh, plate, and we could verify the provenance of all those things happening, we could bring radical transparency to the food we put on our plates, but to much more than that too. I think payment rails are really, really obvious ones. All those people around the world that now have a smartphone can now participate and become harnessed by economic activity on the internet. And that is tremendously powerful. So let's keep that in mind too. But maybe one of the most compelling reasons and one we should think about the most right now is a store of value. So a lot of us last year who hold uh, pounds in our balances saw a depreciation of 17%. When that happens in a frontier and emerging market, you have headlines of collapse and complete financial instability. That happened here. And it wasn't just here. It happened in Argentina, in Venezuela, in Greece, in Greece, in, Greece, in Ukraine, in China. Why is the money devaluating? You have all kinds of experts to talk about this, but it's pretty simple. If they keep making much, much more of it, then everything that we own becomes worth less and less and less. In fact, it's all designed to encourage you to flip the money over, spend, and increase the amount of monetary uh, rapidity. And there are some economists that think that's a really good idea. I think there are some that would argue that that's not the case. And uh, as a store of value, imagine being a person that was able to hold on to a digital asset that you yourself are the bearer of, the custodian of. And if you could hedge against the global risk or hedge against even the local risk of a currency manipulation, well, that might be something that would be important to you. So the most interesting thing, if we just spend a few minutes looking over the horizon, um, and if we all took out a, a 20 pound note today and looked at it, we might think it was kind of funny, right? We'd have to explain who the picture of the old person is and why it has all those numbers on it and it's kind of dirty and it's inconvenient to use for a lot of transactions. Um, so, what if that actual note was a piece of information that you could program to do other types of things? Well, this is where the future gets really exciting. Imagine that your refrigerator has a balance on it. It's actually a smart device connected to the internet, and it knows what your budget is for food this month. And then when you run out of the beers in your fridge, it actually dials up the local drone delivery service that flies over to Amazon, that picks up a six pack of beer, that flies it back and drops it off in front of your house, and then it goes off and lands on your neighbor's roof to recharge on the solar panel that that guy invested in. And when that all happens, a geolocational trigger goes off, the refrigerator makes payments to everybody, and you have beer before you get home. If you don't think that's not cool, well, I don't know, but I've got other ideas too. <laughs> But I think that world's not that far away. 10 years ago, we didn't have an iPhone. Where will we be 10 years from now? So, whether you were born in the first world or the third, whether you were running a for-profit or a non-profit, whether you're a parent sending funds home to a daughter or a child sending remittances back home to your parents, I believe this technology that's built on an open protocol, that's fair, that's accessible to all, is gonna dramatically change the way we think about the tools that we use, and especially in the way we interact with each other economically. So, um, I think and submit to you that it's time to reimagine money. So, thank you very much for your time today.